and and I want to welcome everybody to this evening that will be a very of interest to all of us of great interest so I will first of all stop talking so I'm going to ask Judy Silver if she would like to read um, a Devar, get, give us a Devar Torah. And so let's, let's, let's start with that. I know Judy's here. She's muted. Judy, you're muted. Judy! You're muted. <laughs> I will start again. Tu B'Shvat celebrated throughout the world on the 15th day of Shvat, which I believe is next Tuesday, has an interesting history. It represents a symbolic tie to the land of Israel, where it is the season of nature's rebirth. In our North American climate, it's still midwinter. However, celebrating the spring festival, we are able to lift our spirits and realize that spring is just around the corner. Oh. There, are many there are many references to planting in the Bible and the Pentateuch lists many rules regarding planting, pruning, and the harvesting of the fruit of the trees and the produce of the fields. The importance of trees is indicated in Deuteronomy 2019-20, 20, where it is written, when in your war against a city, you have to besiege it a long time in order to capture it. You must not destroy its trees. You may eat of them, but you must not cut them down. Trees have always been a dominant creative force in the rebuilding and development of the land of Israel. Not only have they served the purpose of beautification, shade, and reclamation, but they have rendered nourishment and vitality to both the land and the people. Trees have always been a dominant creative force. Oh, sorry, I think I read that. But there is another lesson to be learned from Tubishva taught in the familiar Talmudic story of the Emperor Hadrian, who met an old Jew planting a carob tree, which does not attain maturity for 70 years. The Emperor said, by the time your tree bears fruit, you will be long dead. The old man replied, yes, but my father planted a tree whose fruits I enjoyed, so I will plant for my children. As we have been nourished and strengthened by the fruits of the trees planted by those who came before us, so too must we, pl must we plant the seeds and saplings for our children and grandchildren. As the traditions and rituals that we carry out are rooted in a rich past spanning over 5,000 years, so is the future of Judaism dependent on the performance of the mitzvot today. And this was by Phyllis Brody, Brody St. Paul, Minnesota, 5747. Thank you, Judy. Uh, now I would like to ask, Doreen has um, something that she would like to talk with us about. So Doreen. Thank you. I just came off a meeting uh, about a program that Women's League for Conservative Judaism is planning on January the 30th. And um, as a member of Beth David Women, do you know that you're a member of Women's League for Conservative Judaism? Do you get the newsletter every week? If you don't, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Please let me know and I will get your name on the list because there are so many programs that are happening almost every day now on Zoom. We're attending programs all over North America and Israel. So it's, it's very important for you to know that you've got this um, available to you. Um, so as a member of Women's League, you're invited to the program on Sunday, January 30th, which is at noon, our time. It's called Who Owns the Western Wall? And there will be a discussion between the women of the wall, Women's League for Conservative Judaism and Women of Reform Judaism, about the uh, Robbins Arch problem, I'll call it agreement, because uh, it's not an agreement accepted right now. Um, it's very important that, wow, well, the women of the wall need our support. And they're asking that all women of Women's League come to this program. 
So if you get the newsletter, the registration information is in it. You can just click on and go straight to registration. Um, the other thing is, did you know that Women of the Wall have a Rush Hodesh program at the wall once a month? And it's on Facebook Live. It's, yes, it's midnight hour time. It's 7 a.m. in the morning their time. But quite a few of the women from Women's League join and watch and we send comments. And our support is very important to them because what they're trying to do is important for all Jewish women. So um, if you want to attend that, you have to like Women of the Wall on Facebook. You'll get their updates and you'll get access to join the Rosh Hodesh once a month. Um, one other thing, I did make notes, but I'm talking without them. Hang on one second. Um, okay, so the other thing is that Women of the Wall on Facebook is not just open to women. So any of you men out there who would like to support our Mazorti women in Israel, you're welcome to like Facebook as well and join us. Lots of men do. Okay, so I just wanted you to, to understand how important it is for us to support these women. And I urge you to let me know if you're not getting the newsletter and to sign up to register for this program because it should be really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. They're also very interesting. Okay, um, now I think that we should begin with our program. So I would like to call on Anna to introduce our speaker for the evening, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, Ellen. Judy Kasman. <clears throat> Judy is a first generation Canadian born in Toronto. She always thought that she was 50% Litvak and 50% Galiziana, until a DNA test revealed that she is 1% Nigerian. But that was a surprise. Judy has a BA and a B.Ed. from U of T. <clears throat> she has been researching her family for about 19 years and currently has about 2,400 people on her family tree. I'd like to know how you keep that in, <laughs> in shape. Judy is an active member of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Toronto, where she is currently past president. Prior to serving as president, she volunteered for eight years as editor of Shem Telf, uh, the uh, society's bulletin. She is only somewhat obsessed with genealogy. And Judy has kindly given me a handout of helpful websites you might want to look at after the talk or tomorrow or the next day. And I've put my email address right at the top of the chat. So if you want the handout, please send me an email and I'll send you the handout that Judy gave me. So let's all welcome Judy Kasman. Thank you very much, Anna. Can everyone hear me? I'm having trouble with my hearing. Um, I've turned everything up. So if everybody can talk a little bit louder, I'd appreciate it. So I'd like to thank Anna for the introduction. In genealogy language, Anna is my husband's second cousin's wife's aunt. So <laughs> welcome to my talk. And I wish everyone a happy 2022 and lots of good health. And thanks for coming out on such a cold evening. I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, what I've discovered about genealogy over the past 19 years of research. What is a genealogist? This is someone who obsessively researches the births, marriages, and deaths of family members, attempting to learn more about their family history. A genealogist uses every tool available including interviewing relatives, checking out websites, libraries, and archives, examining home collections of artifacts such as letters, photos, and documents, and hiring professional researchers and taking a, gene a DNA test too, if you'd like. How can you spot a genealogist? 
This is someone who likes to check out information on headstones and yard site plaques, who's interested in family photos, especially the information scrawled on the back, who understands you when you describe your uncle's mother's cousin's first cousin's niece. It's the go-to person about familial relationships. And it's a person who gets excited where, when he or she makes a family discovery and also sheps nephes when someone else makes a discovery. A genealogist likes to meet long lost or new relatives and can talk about genealogy for hours and hours while others' eyes glaze over. So what do you need? What does it take to be a genealogist? Here are some of the traits, but there are more, of course. It takes curiosity. What do you want to know or discover? It takes persistence. You can't give up, you keep on trying. It takes a lot of patience understand that you might not find out things right away. It takes detective work. You have to look for clues everywhere. It takes reasoning. You have to look for logic, such as when checking dates and locales. You need good research skills. You have to learn where to look and how to find information. Computer skills are really, really beneficial. You have to have a lot of muzzle or luck. Sometimes things just fall into place or a valuable clue can suddenly and unexpectedly come your way. You have to have a lot of time because it's an endeavor that can take hours, days, and years. You have to have good communication skills. These are vital for interviewing family members and corresponding with old or new relatives. Excuse me, can I interest you in a Canada Protection Plan life insurance policy? You have to. Do you know that our rates are among and the lowest in the country? I could do both. Oh. Protection plans. Anyone between the ages of 18 to 80. Canada Protection Plan. Anyone between the ages of We offer up to $750,000 in coverage for the medical life insurance. And up to $1 million Good. on our But offense. everybody, please. Also, your the business will start until the second month. So, Satov has to mute. Somebody with the last name Satov. Please mute, thank you. You have to have good networking. You have to be able to network because the more you communicate with others about your quest, the better chance you have of making a discovery. By joining a local genealogical society, you learn from the experience of others. One thing I also wanted to mention today in the star, there's an article, 34 easy things you can do for yourself and the author, Christine Sismondo was talking about things that one can do during. Also, a statement to us from Donna Duncan with the end. Please, uh, hello, Mrs. Satok, please mute yourself. Can the host mute, mute I'm all the I'm trying to, I'm trying to, hold on, I'm trying to, I can't seem to. Okay, uh, okay, sorry, okay, she's muted. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so Christina Sismondo was talking about 34 things one can do during the pandemic. She mentions whether it's a new recipe, walking route, book, or friend, variety can help mark time and stop it from becoming a big pandemic blur. And genealogy is a perfect thing to do while you're sitting at home during a pandemic. Because you're at your computer, it's great. Genealogy is life-changing. You connect with others, those you knew before and those you never knew existed. You become a lifelong sleuth, always looking for clues. You're never bored. There is always more to research. The jigsaw puzzle that is your family tree is never complete. You become a collector and an archivist of family lore, records, and photographs. You learn more about your family history and can become your family historian, preserver of the family heritage. You become a storyteller, relating the stories that you have learned in your research. You are rewarded by making discoveries and connections. You make like-minded friends who understand your obsession. So to test DNA or not to test DNA, that is the question. Some people test for genealogical reasons, while others for health reasons. For health, people want to seek family history treatment family history for certain illnesses or conditions. And some testing companies are better for health results, such as 23andMe. For genealogy, DNA searching is fun and interesting, but it is a good idea to have a foundation of family tree information before trying to figure out your genealogy versus DNA. 
DNA is a tool in a genealogist's toolbox. It doesn't replace good old fashioned research, but can enhance it. Jennifer Mendelssohn is an American writer who explains Jewish DNA very well. She is the host of the Jewish DNA Facebook page, I understand. And when asked which company is the best to test with, she responds that it's best to use the company where most of your relatives have tested. That way you can more easily figure out other common relatives when you see your um, connections with ones that you know. She has used DNA to help find families of victims of the Holocaust. A few things to keep in mind. The Ashkenazi Jewish population is endogamous. That is, people historically married others in the same community within Eastern Europe in the Pale of Settlement. Hence, Ashkenazi Jews tend to share uh, DNA to some degree, and that makes figuring out relationships a little more complicated. And you have to be aware that when you're testing DNA, some dis surprise discoveries can occur, such as that someone might discover that their parent is really not their parent, or that you might have siblings that you are unaware of. Barry Stevens is an award-winning Canadian writer and filmmaker. Now 70, he discovered as a young adult that he was conceived by a Jewish sperm donor in England. This donor, a scientist, had run a fertility clinic with his wife, a physician, in London in the 40s and 50s. Since the advent of DNA testing, Stevens has discovered that he has over 600 half-siblings. This story is documented in his 2020 documentary, The World's Biggest Family. This was shown on the CBC and can be seen at their website, I think through GEM. Many of these siblings often get together in England and have found that they share common professions and senses of humor. Strangely enough. And Stephen supports the idea of ending the Canadian law that ensures sperm donor anonymity, although not all of his siblings agree with this. American author Lily Copeland has recently written a book entitled The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are, and she examines how DNA has changed our lives and describes this shift in her book. She shows that those who test for DNA have to be prepared for the possibility of some big surprises for better or for worse. And there are privacy issues. Is your information really secure when you test for DNA? You have to do your homework before you embark on a test. So here's my homepage from my heritage where I did a test. And this was in February. It showed that I had 21,432 matches. I checked today. Now I'm up to 21,721 matches on DNA. So out of my 21,000 and more relatives, how many do I know how I'm related to? Well, you might be surprised to know that the answer is four. And these are relatives that I knew before. It is very, very difficult for me to figure out how I'm related to the rest, despite my efforts to do so. I would guess that I'm related to many of you on this Zoom call just by virtue of being Ashkenazi Jews. But some interesting names have come up in my DNA testing. I discovered that I'm related to Rabbi Schild and Rabbi Gabriel Seed and Amy Skye. George Brady from Hannah's Suitcase and Joe Schlesinger, but I don't know even which side of the family the connection is. So it's a challenge. But let me show you where I've had some successes. On the website for Library and Archives Canada, there are Canadian ship records where you can see when relatives came to Canada, where they landed, where they departed from, but these records are available only for certain years. And you can search these names by surname. And you can look at naturalization records to find out when your relatives became naturalized or that is when they became Canadian citizens. You have to look for databases and search by surname. And these are for the years 1915 to 1951. So just to show you what the page looks like, the Library and Archives page under search the collection, and databases. And I'll show you an example of what I found. Here's the report of the naturalization branch. And these are my relatives. I know a few of my cousins are on this call and, and these are their grandparents. So we have Jack and
Rachel Gollum as Dorothy Farberman and her sister. Looks like Judy's frozen. Judy, you're frozen. I think the other Kasman went in to fix it. I'm sure she'll be back any moment. Hi. Technical Don't technical worry. difficulties. Good, good. What's John? We're all so quiet, waiting in anticipation. anticipation. We're all muted. Yeah. We're all sitting on Spilkas yeah. here. <laughs> Did she disappear too? Well, her, her husband left, so I was assuming that he probably went in the other room to um, to fix the technical difficulties. Yes, because yes, she left, so, and he left, so I guess they left to, uh, okay, she's back. Hold on, hold on. Wait. I'm sorry, my internet went out in the middle. So here we go. We'll, we'll we more. knew you were coming back. I'm sorry about that. Punct, punct in the middle. Okay. And no refreshments for you, Judy. No refreshment. No, no kiddish for me. Okay, so if you could just share, let me share your screen. We'll go back in. Okay, thank you. I'm not allowed, uh, if you could let me hear your screen again, we'll go back. Here. Ellen, you have to make Judy a host again. Oh, so sorry, 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 okay. sorry. I forgot about that. Okay, sorry. Okay, we're good now. Okay, we're good, all right. Yes. Okay, let me go back. And make sure everybody, please put yourself back on mute. Thank you. Okay. Sure, still, I heard something. No, not giving into the right thing. Yes. 
sorry. Let me get back to my present. Okay, now I think I muted you, Judy, sorry. Unmute you. Oh, here we are. Okay, yes. sorry. Okay. Mute everybody, I, I, everybody, please mute yourself, please. Thank you. Sorry, let's hope that my internet doesn't kick me out again. But anyhow, back where we were, um, I'm on the page where Jack and Joseph Gollum, my great uncles, got became Canadian citizens. It shows that they were from Lithuania and their wives were sisters, Rachel and Anna. Um, and two minor children being Dorothy and Meyer. So I don't know at what point I cut out, but um, Jack and Rachel are the parents of Dorothy, being Dorothy Farberman, your Beth David member, and her sister Ida Peacock was not yet born, so she was not naturalized. And uh, Jack's brother, Joseph, and his wife Anna are the parents of Muriel Mendelssohn, also a Beth David member. And uh, here they are, they became Canadian citizens on July the 14th, 1931, having been born in Lithuania, um, they came to Canada in the 20s. And both Jack and Joseph, the brothers, were tinsmiths, and they lived in Toronto. Now, interesting, my grandfather, who was their brother, my grandfather Isaac, who was uh, killed in the Holocaust because he remained in Lithuania, he was also a tinsmith, and their father also was a tinsmith, so it appears to have been a family trade. So this was an interesting document that I found at Library and Archives Canada under naturalization records. And another very interesting set of documents that I found were under immigrants approved in orders of council. Now in this collection, um, people had to have special dispensation to come to Canada as immigrants because in general, immigrants were not allowed to come to the country between 1929 and 1960. So in Ottawa, two sisters, Joanna Crandall and Eleanor Sullivan, found these records and decided to digitize them and make them available for the public. So um, when I perused the records using the last names, Kernkraut being my maiden name and Gollum, being my mother's maiden name, I wanted to see if I could find any connection to these Privy Council records. So um, this shows what information can be found in the records. So when I put in the name Kernkraut, I discovered that my uncle Max Kernkraut was permitted entry to Canada by order of Privy Council on February the 8th, 1949. So I wrote to the sisters and paid whatever fee they asked in order to get a copy of the records. And this was really interesting. This is what the records look like. On this page, there's the official document. You can see the approval, date of February, 1949. And it was approved by Field Marshal, the Right Honorable, the Viscount Alexander of Tunis, Knight Grand Cross of the Most Honorable Order of the Bath, et cetera, et cetera. And he was the Governor General and Commander in Chief of the Dominion of Canada, from 1946 to 1952. I did not know the name of the governor general at that time. And this is what it is. It's a very lengthy name. And these are the other people who were on the committee with this governor general. And then you can see the signature and it says approved. Alexander of Tunis, February 8th, 1949. So his very long name is shortened. He was called Alexander of Tunis. And a little segment of this uh, page indicates that the November 26th, 1947 provisions of order in council PC 
4849, prohibiting the landing in Canada of immigrants of all classes and occupations, with certain exceptions, be waived in the cases of the immigrants. So in this case, for this state, there was a total of 89 immigrants who applied to get the exemption so that they could come to Canada. And here's a little synopsis about my uncle, Moses Mendel Kerncraft, otherwise known as Uncle Max. And I'll give you a few minutes to read this. Okay. He was coming from Trinidad. So as you could see at the end, it summarizes as it would be, a, as it would appear that he has the necessary technical knowledge to enable him to become established. It is considered his application might be favorably dealt with. So he was allowed to remain um, by this order of Privy Council. And so he did. He established himself in Toronto and then he brought my father to be with him here. And when I searched in the Privy Council records under the sponsors list, I discovered that my Gollum great uncles, Joseph and Jack, that you had seen earlier on the naturalization records, had sponsored their Mahutin, that is their wife's father, Zelik Trotsky, to come from Lithuania to Toronto. His application was approved on August 30th, 1934, by Governor General B.B. Bennett. Trotsky's summary states that his case had been submitted by Colonel G.E. Geary, MP. And then there's Holocaust era research. I've done quite a bit of that, given my Holocaust background. My mother was a survivor and my father lost his first family in the Holocaust. And there's an infinite amount of databases available. And here are four major ones. There's Yad Vashem where there are digital collections of pages of testimony. And you can submit pages of testimony for those who've not yet been documented. There are the Arlson Archives, which is the International Tracing Services of the Red Cross. So this was the database of people who were looking for those who might have survived the war or for survivors who were looking for relatives that they that uh, lived in other countries other than war-torn Europe. There are the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, which is a great database. Um, it's a great resource for Holocaust research and there are many, many databases and all kinds of information there. And there's the USC Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles. And this features a virtual history archive. So if you have any relatives who recorded their Holocaust testimonies in Toronto, um, it's most likely that they're archived there in LA and you can request them to send you a digital copy of the testimony as I recently did for my mother. So here's one example of a discovery that I made researching the Arlson archives. When I searched the name Kernkraut in the digital Arlson Archives, I discovered, if you look at the lower part of the screen, uh, that there's a person named Samuel Regalhaupt who was in the Belson DP camp, and he was looking for my father and his brothers in Trinidad. And this inquiry was dated November 30th, 1945. And he was looking for his cousin and three brothers who he knew were in Trinidad. It says the date of last communication was in 1939 from the West Indies. This really caught me by surprise to find out that someone in, in a DP camp was, was looking for someone in Trinidad. This really surprised me. And then in this file, there is correspondence where my father was looking for Sam, his cousin Samuel Regalhaupt, and Samuel Regalhaupt was looking for Samuel Kernkraut. They were first cousins. And here are some of the information included in my father's correspondence. Basically, he was trying to send a parcel and trying to send money through the rabbinate. And I don't know if ultimately 
the two Samuels, Regal, Hopped, and Kernkraut ever connected afterwards. But I know that Samuel Regal Haupt ended up coming to Chicago and my father ended up coming to Toronto from Trinidad. Well, one of the major sites for Jewish genealogical research is Jewish Gen. And you need to just create a username and password and most of it is free, although there's some advanced features if you give some uh, donations. And you can see the tab called databases. And here is a list, uh, the more thorough list of the databases that are available. You can see many countries are listed and there's even Spartac research and, and all kinds of other information. And in this case, I'm going to zero in on two databases, one being the Jewish Gen Online Worldwide Burial Registry, JOBAR for short, and the other one being the Jewish Gen Memorial Plaques databases. Now, uh, Jewish Gen has interna international databases for both the memorial plaques and the yard site plaques. And thanks to the hard work of the volunteers of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Toronto, um, who has digitized and photographed most of the matzebas in the Toronto cemeteries, in the Toronto area cemeteries, they've been sent to the worldwide burial registry and you can do searches and memorial plaques similarly, but not to the same extent thus far as the uh, Masebas. So why is that information important for genealogists? Well, the um, information that's on them is important because you have the names, the English names or other languages and the Hebrew names. You have the father's name, sometimes the mother's name. You have the dates of death in the Gregorian calendar and on the Hebrew calendar. So at Jewish Gen under databases, here's for the burial registry. In this case, I put in the name Kernkraut. If you don't know the exact spelling of the name, there are other options for similar names, for sound alike names, but I know definitely that I wanted the name Kernkraut and I put in for geographical location, Ontario. And when I did that, I found the, um, the headstone, the Matseva for my uncle Israel Kernkraut, who's buried at Dawes Road Cemetery, along with the photograph. And you can see from the carving at the top that he was a levy. It shows, it shows the pitcher of water that levy use in the ritual. And in the Hebrew, it shows that Israel Ben Asher Zelig Halevi. We know that there are levies. And for the Memorial Plaques database, in this case, I searched the name Gollum and I put in for um, Ontario. And it shows that there are four, yards, four Memorial Plaque records with the name Gollum. And here are the names of Jack and Joseph Gollum and Anna and Rachel Gollum. Those are the same un great uncles and aunts of mine that you saw in previous slides. So it gives their date of birth, date of death, their Hebrew names transliterated, and it shows that all of these plaques are at Beth David in the sanctuary. I would say upstairs of the sanctuary, but we're not there. And the pictures of the Ortai plaques are also displayed. So as I was mentioning, joining a genealogical society is really helpful because People, the members learn from one another. We learn tricks from one another. We learn tips. And here's a little video about our society. The Jewish Genealogical Society of Toronto, or simply JGS Toronto, founded in 1985, comes under the umbrella of the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies. Our society is totally volunteer run and has a membership of over 200 keen genealogists. JGS Toronto invites you to become a member. You will be doing a mitzvah. By preserving your Jewish past, you will offer loving guidance to the living members of your family, honor the deceased, and leave a legacy for future generations. Genealogy is the study of one's ancestors. Who were your relatives? Where and how did they live? When did they immigrate? 
What were their stories? By searching records and by means of DNA testing, we attempt to validate or identify our origins as well as connect with new relatives. Our Mentors and Maidens program will try to assist members who are new to genealogical research or who have challenges to overcome in their research by matching them with member mentors who have the required experience or expertise. This assistance can rely on databases on websites such as Jewish Gen, Ancestry, MyHeritage, and Family Search. Member mentors can help with the use of these genealogical websites and more. Our special interest groups, or SIGs for short, are open only to members. SIGs allow members with particular interests to share knowledge, ideas, and information. Currently, we have four active SIGs, which convene every few months. Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Belarus, Ukraine, and DNA. The Central Europe SIG is currently on hold with the hope of its reinstatement in the future. Other SIGs can be created depending on the needs of our membership. Our monthly programs and SIG meetings have been held virtually during the pandemic. When we return to in-person meetings, we will likely be going with a hybrid model, that is in-person with virtual capabilities. Sher Shemaim Congregation in Toronto is our traditional location for our monthly presentations by experts covering a wide range of topics of interest to genealogical researchers. As in the past, SIG meetings can be held at Sher Shemaim as well. The Family History Center is a site that we might return to in the future for some SIG meetings. This location has free access to many genealogical websites for your research. Stay tuned. Shemto, our quarterly newsletter, keeps you abreast of the latest genealogical developments. Back issues are indexed by date, subject, and author, going back to our first newsletter published in 1985. Our society's library collection is housed at the Humanities and Social Science Department of the Toronto Reference Library. Our reference collection includes important genealogical books and resources that will help you with your research. Our members volunteer on several projects. Here are a sample of the projects that have helped researchers locally and worldwide. Jewish Gen Online Worldwide Burial Registry, Jewish Gen Memorial Plaques Indexing, and the Toronto Jewish Families History Projects. In 2013, our society received the IAJGS Award for Outstanding Publication by a Member Organization for its anthology, Tracing Our Roots a compilation of over 45 compelling and entertaining stories written by our members. As a member, you will benefit from the various types of ongoing events we hold. We have monthly presentations by experts covering a wide range of topics and interests. There are hands-on workshops on different topics, including technology, and there are special interest group meetings. All of these will help you research and learn about your ancestors. Our annual year-end program in June, and the highlight of the year for many is entitled Brick Walls and Breakthroughs, where a few members are delighted to present their personal genealogical discoveries. Our society invites you to share your knowledge as you learn and network with other researchers living in Canada and around the world. It's easy to join. Visit jgstoronto.ca and click on Join, then on Become a Member. Membership in our society, a nonprofit charitable organization, is $40 per year, $50 for a couple, or $18 for a student, and it is totally tax deductible for Canadians. We have over 200 members spanning the globe. Our members come from Australia, Israel, and from cities across Canada and the United States. Our excellent Zoom presentations have afforded us the opportunity to establish stronger connections with people everywhere. We welcome you to join our international family of genealogists. So thanks very much for watching and listening and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Judy, if I may start off, 
um, <clears throat> Sana. Um, yes. yes. I, uh, I just want to make a comment that um, thanks very much. Besides, you'll have a formal thank you later. But the book um, that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a participant in that book. Mm -hmm. And uh, tells my story. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Here's the book. Yeah, now that's it. Tracing our roots and um, and the plaques. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, at one of the meetings I was at, the Jewish genealogy, uh, it was somebody was talking about how important recording the plaques were. And I, I approached our shul and got permission. And I think Jerry Scherer came mm -hmm. and uh, he had a nice camera and a steady hand, which I don't have. And he spent hours taking pictures of all the plaques at uh, Beth David. And so I'm so pleased to see that that information is being uh, used. I, I always wondered if, you know, what happened afterwards kind of thing. Yeah, it's... But it was used. So thank you very much. Uh, you. If you don't mind my starting off the questions, um, I have uh, a very plain name to go with my my grandparents last name was Miller and <clears throat> on the other side it was Brown which I found out later was Brodsky so it's easier to find Brodsky but how on earth do I go about looking for Miller I mean it's such a common common name it, it's tricky and also you don't know what the name started out as You'd have, to find, you'd have to find some immigration records or some ship records to give you some clues as to what um, spelling or, or if you know what town they originated from. But yeah, I, I think the, your best bet would be to try and find some immigration records that would have um, the, the name in its original form. Well, they, they moved from Europe to, to England. So mm, where would I look there? Before, you'd have to find out like where they came from before they ended up in England, if possible. You'd have to keep digging, digging back. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yes, Noreen. Okay, two things. Uh, we happen to know somebody who's part of that family with the fertility clinic. Uh, which I, I still can't wrap my head around it. And the other thing is before you do uh, genetic testing or DNA test, uh, I had breast cancer about, I don't know, 20 to 25 years ago. And after I was all finished with the treatment, I, just, I thought I would go back to North York General and ask for genetic testing. And I went and I, I started the process and she asked me a bunch of questions and told me certain things I should look for. And then I started to hear articles on uh, the radio about American health insurance companies who would deprive people of their coverage if they found out that somebody in your family had a genetic disposition to a, a disease. And since at that time, our eldest daughter was living in the States and re really wasn't going to come back, I, I discontinued the whole thing because the, the do our daughters knew what I had and they knew to speak to their doctors but I didn't want to know and I, because I didn't want her to lose her insurance coverage. Because in the States, this is very important. So before you go on that route, you should make sure what kind of worms you're going to uncover. True. So here's Anna's article in the book called There Must Be a Better Way. And there's a photograph. Your grandfather, Lewis Miller, and other members of her family. 
it will just promote that. Are there any other questions? Yes, I'd like to ask one. You know, they're sure. commenting quite often about ancestry and um, which is noted in that video, but I'm curious to know, I've heard good and bad about it, that some people feel it's a fraud that it's not authentic enough? Do you know anything about that? Well, I mean, there, it's not a fraud, but, but it's just, it's not a hundred percent science because they're going on the pool of people that have tested it. But like, you'll see the people who show up as your relative, if you know them, it, it's true. Like the people that show up as your relative really are related to you. You can tell from close people who've tested that it shows an authentic relationship. It's not. It's not a fraud, but um, it, it's really subjective, depending on on the um, the pool of people that have tested within their company. So it's 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 weighted, but it, it's not like a hundred percent. But it it but it isn't a fraud. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, Stephen. Hi, Ken. Those are Gollum. Those are grandsons of the Gollum. There was Gollums that I knew that uh, were related to the um, Arnoffs and Rubinoffs, and I didn't know whether that had anything to do with the Gollums that I know. There was one from Beth Chickfat. What was her name? I forgot. Oh, Debbie Gollum. Oh, and her husband true. was her husband. Mervin. Yeah, that's G-O-L-O-M. Okay, yeah, um, Marianne, spelling. that's Len's cousins. Ben. <laughs> um, Judy, are you related to them, the, those golems? No, because it's a different, it's a little different name. This, our golems are G-O-L-O-M-B and those ones are G-O-L-L-O-M. So you know what, know. you're right, you're right. I, I don't but know I thought they're... maybe being an unusual name, but maybe they were. Oh, there are a lot of golems, like our spelling, there, there are many, many. And I don't know if we're related to all of them, but we're, yeah, it's, it's a, not an uncommon name. Um, Judy, uh, Rabbi Shield is also shows up in my family. Oh. <laughs> okay. And you know the ironic thing, Len's first cousin's son is married, married to, to Rabbi to Shield's granddaughter. granddaughter. <laughs> It continues. <laughs> That's Jewish geography. I know, I know. Sense, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions. Yeah, I have a, I have a comment. Anna or, has another one. <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. well, <clears throat> I had a cousin in Australia who was <clears throat> said that she was willing to uh, go further and pay somebody in Poland to um, to see about our relatives, uh, to do some digging. And I wasn't willing to go along with it because I didn't, I don't speak Polish. I don't know um, if we're paying money out to somebody who's just going to, um, I, you know, take us for a ride. Um, how, how do you know when you, um, are there organizations in different countries where you can get reliable, honest people who can do the digging for you? Well, you have to ask other people who've had success in um, hiring researchers in other countries, because then like people have had good tour guides or good translators, you have to ask around and, and see who um, who has, has used these people before and get some recommendations. Okay, so the, so the, yes, the special interest group would be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. or, or from our society, there's Ala Gumulka, who's the Mentors and Mavens oh. Coordinator, and she would be a good person to ask. Oh, so that's, Anna, at the that's beginning- our, That's a cousin of my husband's, Alan. <laughs> Um, so, Anna, at the beginning, you mentioned how I can keep track of all my 2,400 relatives. Well, I have to mention that I use Family Tree software. There are various programs. 
um, available where you can plot in all of your family members. It keeps track of everyone. It tells you how you're related to this one and that one, and you can enter documents and photographs. And per personally, I use Family Tree Maker, but other people have preferences for other software, but there are quite a number of different products on the market and that can help you um, organize everything. What did you say about Alla? What is her position? She's the coordinator of the Mentors and Mavens program in our society, oh, which will help you. A first cousin to my late husband. Yeah. Okay. Alla. Oh, that's funny. But okay. um, how do you, um, again, I know my son-in-law is very interested in genealogy and what he started with was the, um, uh, the ship the registry of ships and he mm -hmm. found relatives and the when they came across mm -hmm. uh that was just like you had there uh they had the names of his family mm -hmm. and you know they landed up in winnipeg but uh, mm -hmm. when they came across he had the names with the children it didn't necessarily with children it might say a minor child yes but it'll have usually the birth date it'll say which relative they're coming to yeah. Um, it'll give you other particulars, what port they left, what when they arrived. Um, also, if your um, relatives came through Halifax, you could write to Pier 21 and try and get records. Um, if you can get landing records in, in Ottawa from the immigration, you can write to get landing documents. There, there, there is a vast number of material available. It's just uh, never ending, really. Okay, so um, I think we've learned a lot. There's a lot to absorb, Judy, but I still will call Judy and call my aunt, Anna, and call my sister-in-law. <laughs> let, them, let them do the work. Let them do the work. Yeah, I want to thank you so much for coming. And really, I wish it could have been in person. And may, maybe next year we'll be able to have meetings in person. Uh -huh. But uh, it was great to see you, great to see everybody, to, to, yeah, to be with people with no masks on. How exciting is that? <laughs> so, uh, and we'll see you next month. Uh, next month is, we're going to have two people come and talk to us about the Taylor Project which is a, a project where uh, a group of Jewish businessmen brought people to Canada. I think it was mostly after the war who, who would say they were tailors. They might not have been tailors, but they had to be willing to say that. Anyway, I, 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 can I say something about that? will allow you to say something. Thank you. So <laughs> when I discovered that um, somebody in my society, her father was hired under the Taylor Project by my uncle Max Kerncroach to work <laughs> in his shoe factory. I, ha I had no idea, but um, that's, that was very interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. so people from the, from the garment, industry in Canada went over after the war to try and hire displaced persons so right. that they would be able to come in. A lot of the people did have tailoring skills, but as you mentioned, not necessarily. Not everybody. No. Not everybody. So they were hired and um, they were hired across Canada, like in the garment trade in Montreal and, and out west and in Toronto. So interestingly enough, we discovered the letter that the um, the government wrote to my uncle to garnish three dollars a week from this person to repay his train from Halifax <laughs> to Toronto. <laughs> oh, yeah. typical, typical. Anyhow, there's all kinds of things you can discover when you're doing research. And yeah. And if yeah. you have any questions, like feel free to um, to write to our society and. Um, I'm there, Linda. Linda Rock. And don't forget that that Judy gave me a handout, which I will send out to anybody who 
uh, emails me. Uh, now I want to ask, questions. and you can print it out. Okay, Linda, what did you want to ask? Uh, we have a distant cousin by the name of Laura Greenberg who has put a story in uh, the Taylor Project book oh, about, nice. about her parents, uh, Pearl and David Shadleski. I I sent her the email today about the program coming up. Good. I don't know if she's going to, I don't think she has any pictures, but uh, my husband's grandfather and her husband and her grandfather were brothers. So uh, your, oh, our father. Okay, I've got the relationship mixed up. But anyway, I've invited her to join in and she may have some comments about what has been written in the book. Well, we'll, we'll look to, to see her next month. Okay, thank you again. Thank you, Judy, and everybody for coming. And uh, we hope to see you next month, too. Okay, we're going to stop the recording. Thank you, Judy. That was great.